you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question, a question for the president. Do you hate all rich people? Or just those who aren't campaign contributors? The president sure seems to like George Kaiser, the 20th richest man in America. President Obama likes him so much that he gave Kaiser's company, Solyndra, a billion dollars, a half a billion dollars, which you may have heard got flushed down the drain. To get Mr. Kaiser this money, the president came up with a brilliant plan. Let's appoint people to approve the loans who are related to the people who are going to get the loans. So, Solyndra's attorney simply called up her husband, who works for the Department of Energy, to secure a half a billion dollar loan. What a great way to encourage campaign contributions. Give away enormous taxpayer loans to campaign contributors. So to be fair, the president doesn't really hate all rich people, just those who don't contribute to his campaign. They say it's not easy to be rich, especially if you inherit the money. It's hard, you know, just laying by the pool, playing polo. So when I heard Robert Kennedy Jr. was starting up his own company, I thought, good for him. I hope he'll find the satisfaction of good old-fashioned work. My good feelings, though, you know, soured a bit when I heard Robert Kennedy's idea of work involves $1.6 billion of taxpayer money. So while the president roams the country moaning about millionaires and billionaires not paying their fair share, his aides are in the White House making sure that millionaires and billionaires are getting their fair share of your money. Now how did Robert Kennedy come to get this $1.6 billion? Same way George Kaiser got his. Kennedy got one of his employees a job at the Department of Energy. And then the former employee approved the loan. Where's the taxpayer in all this? Left holding the bag. Where's the country? Left with a $15 trillion debt. So the president doesn't really hate all rich people. If you're a crony, if you're a buddy of Barack Obama, stop by the White House. They've got a deal for you. Now I have another question. Another question for the president. Do you hate poor people? Or do you just hate poor people with jobs? Your Chinese-made, energy-efficient light bulbs cost $4. Who can afford them? Not to mention that if they break and the mercury spills out of them, you need a hazmat team to clean them up. Mr. President, don't you realize that if you've piled this debt, as you're piling this debt on the backs of working people, that gas prices have doubled, food prices are rising at double digits, and 11 million people are out of work. When you forbid the mining of cheap energy sources, when you ban the new oil pipeline, senior citizens and working families are forced to pay higher electric bills. I really want to know, Mr. President, does your ideology, does your yen for windmills trump your concern for the poor? Does it bother you that Americans live paycheck to paycheck in order to pay for Mr. Kaiser's loan? in order to pay for Mr. Kennedy's loan. Do you, Mr. President, ever reflect that a country that borrows $40,000 a second is heading for a cliff, and you are at the wheel and you are stepping on the gas? Spending is accelerating. We now spend nearly 25% of our GDP in Washington, and nearly half of that is borrowed. Entitlements and interest on the debt will consume all tax revenue in the near future. It is not a question of will a debt crisis occur in America, it's only a question of when. Now in all seriousness, I know because someone will take this literally, I don't think the president hates rich people. I don't think he hates poor people. In fact, I don't impute to the president bad intentions at all. A misguided philosophy, yes, but not bad intentions. But the president, he continues to roam. He roams the country blaming millionaires and billionaires for not paying their fair share. This is objectively false. Millionaires on average pay about 29% of their income. And on average, non-millionaires, the rest of us, myself and many of you, we pay less than 29%. 
The top 10% of earners pay over 70% of the income tax. Let me repeat that. If you make over $200,000 in this country, you pay 70% of the income tax. If he wants the tax code to be fair, he's going to have to reduce the taxes on the rich. The rich and the upper middle class pay virtually all of the income tax. The bottom 47% of earners pay no income tax. To put it kindly, the president is being disingenuous. Is anyone out there tired of hearing about Warren Buffett's secretary? <laughs> We're encouraged to mourn for his poor secretary, who some have estimated probably makes more than $200,000 a year. Realize, and I just realized this recently, this is all a charade. This has been designed for over a year. This is purposely designed to attack any Republican candidate who happens to be successful. The truth is that Warren Buffett pays tens of millions of dollars in taxes, and his secretary pays thousands of dollars in taxes. Buffett, in fact, pays a thousand times more in taxes than his secretary. I believe this election will be about the American dream whether we still believe in the, the greatness of our founding documents. Do we believe in an America where we, the people, interact voluntarily to determine who the winners are? Or do we want a president to dictate who the winners and losers are? Do we really want a fairness czar to enforce equality on us? It's not as if we haven't seen attempts at a fairness doctrine before. The Soviets tried it, so did the Chinese. A recent NPR story described the Chinese experiment with fairness. In 1978, in a small remote village in China, several, father, several farmers gathered in secret, and they signed a compact. This compact was extraordinary and very dangerous. They immediately hid it inside a piece of bamboo in the roof of one farmer's hut. The compact called for illegal action. The compact called for dividing the collective farm, dividing it into families, and letting each family keep the profits. Now, because profit and capitalism were illegal and could command a death sentence in China, each farmer agreed to raise the children of any farmer that was caught and executed. The result was phenomenal. It was the largest harvest in recent memory, so large, though, that it didn't escape the notice of one of the officials. And one of the farmers was hauled before the local commissar. But just as the interrogation was proceeding to a possibly violent end, the word came from Beijing that the long, dark veil of communism was being lifted. As China awakens to capitalism, our president's heading the other way. He's embracing more government, more debt, more government control. This election may be the last best hope of saving the American dream. As we gather to make the choice of who will lead conservatives, I'm reminded of a story by Paul Kenger. It was a brisk evening in Dixon, Illinois in 1922. Returning home from a basketball game at the YMCA, 11-year-old boy is stunned by the sight of his father, sprawled out on the front porch. He was drunk, his son later remembered, dead to the world, crucified. His dad's hair was matted and soaked with snow and his face was red. The boy stood over his father for a minute or two. He was embarrassed. He simply wanted to let himself in the door and pretend his dad wasn't there. Instead, he grabbed a fistful of overcoat and heaved his dad to the bedroom away from the weather's harm and the neighbor's attention. This young man didn't retreat or admit defeat. His struggles didn't lead him to say, oh, woe is me, the world is against me, I can't succeed. When his family moved 30 times when he was growing up, he was not deterred. This young boy became the man Ronald Reagan whose sunny optimism and charisma shined so brightly that it cured the malaise of the late 70s, an optimism that beamed so broadly that it pulled us through a serious recession, and an optimism that tugged so mightily at the heart that a generation of Democrats became Republicans. Who will be that next Ronald Reagan? Who will be our heroes? Who will become the next generation of the great leaders America is great because we've always embraced individual liberty. This belief in the individual is the American dream. To lead us away from the precipice that is this looming debt crisis 
It will take someone who believes in America's greatness, who believes in and can articulate the American dream. If the American dream dies, so does our country. Our prosperity, it comes from our freedom, a freedom that's enshrined and protected by the Constitution. Washington today, though, is ruled by a different sort. You've got special interests on the right and on the left who clamor for more of your money. I sit, they come in front of my office. They're sitting in chairs. I call them the beseechers. They've got their hands out looking for something. There's nothing left to give. We're borrowing 40 cents on every dollar. We're borrowing $40,000 a second. There's nothing left to give them. Even our party has yet to grasp the significance and the imminence of this coming debt crisis. It's coming. It will take bold leadership. This is why I always have said the Republican Party is an empty vessel unless we imbue it with values. We have to believe in something. It will take someone who's able to transform the coldness of austerity into the warm, vibrant embrace of prosperity. We're in the process of discovering who that leader will be. My hope is that in the search for that leader, we also rediscover the passion for individual liberty that made America great. Thank you, and God bless America.